Hi everyone, I hope you've had a really good Christmas so far. Um, okay, so what's next? Uh, looking forward in your Christian life, what's next? You know, um, particularly at this time of year, coming at the end of a year, looking forward to the next year, it's just such a good time to think about where we're at in our Christian lives and to plan then uh, for the next few months, the next year, and so on. It's something that's really important to do. We can't leave it. If you think about our, our gardens, if you, if you left the garden for, I don't know, several months, soon it would become overgrown and it would be a mess, and primarily because of the presence of weeds, similarly in our Christian lives. Um, if we leave it, they get messy, um, and primarily so because of, the pre- because of the presence of sin. So it's just so important that we think about our lives, that we look at our lives Um, And we plan what we'll do in order to make sure we feed our souls in the right way to grow and what we do in order to kill off sin. So before we do, I just want to read a prayer that John Newton prayed. Listen to this. Lord, I know I'm not who I one day will be, but I thank you that I'm not who I used to be. Please make me more like Christ today than I was yesterday. And please answer that prayer each day until I stand before him. I think that's helpful because I think it's important that we're either not too hard on ourselves or too soft on ourselves. Um, If we're too hard on ourselves, we'd probably be racked with guilt. We'd probably look at the year we've just had and think, I don't know if I've grown at all. I've probably gone backwards, if anything, in my Christian life. Um, maybe, um, but then we can really beat ourselves up and that's not going to be any good to us. We need to remember that we're not who we once were and that Christ has done a work with us and we've learned so much about him and we have been serving him. So we've made progress. That's important that we hold on to that. Don't beat yourself up. Don't be too hard on yourself. But at the same time, don't be too soft on yourself either uh, because then you still won't do anything and you won't change and you'll go backwards. So it's important that we're balanced in the way in which we go about this. We're going to begin by looking at the condition of our hearts. So in terms of, I don't know if you've ever done a kind of a spiritual health check before, and it's been, how much do you read your Bible a day? Uh, How much do you pray? How much do you do this? How much do you do? And it's kind of like a section, a selection of questions based on what you're doing. And now some of the action points are going to be that, which I'm going to be giving over the next couple of weeks. But it's, I think it's way more important that we, we ask foundational questions to do with the heart. Because unless our hearts are right, unless our motives are right, whatever we're going to be doing, it'll always be undermined by the fact that our hearts aren't right. Okay, so this is question number one. And I'm only going to ask today one a uh, question of the heart, and it's the most important one. Are you in love with Jesus? Are you in love with Jesus still? Now, what I'm not asking, I'm not asking, do you love Jesus? Because if you're a Christian, you'll say, yeah, I love Jesus. But I'm asking you, it's more of a kind of a feelings thing. When you think about Jesus... Do you have love in your heart for him still? Or has that gone? You know, when we first become Christians, it's it's, it's easier to love Jesus, isn't it? Feels all fresh and new. We we know for for a fact that we were sinners. He's shown us our sin. We realize that Christ Jesus has died to take it all away. It moves us. He changes us from the inside. He comes into our lives. It's exciting. And, and, and there, at that point, we would say, oh, I love him. And we have this feeling, this gushing feeling of love towards him that means we really want to serve him. And maybe we've had that at different times in our life. Now, do, do you have that now? So do, do you still feel that level of love in your heart for Jesus now? Listen to what Jesus wrote in a letter to the church In Ephesus, and you read this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, 
and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. That's a big list of loads of things they were doing. They were doing things really well. They were in one sense a good church, theologically sound, very active. But then Jesus says this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first, your first love. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. He has one thing against them. One thing, but it's such a serious thing. He says, consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. You've forsaken your first love. You no longer love me in the way you once loved me. Now listen to what Paul said to the same church when he wrote a letter to them. This is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, I'm praying that out of his, that's God's glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Do you see what Paul is saying there? He's saying he wants Christ to dwell in their hearts. Does Christ dwell in your heart? Do you have this passionate love for Jesus in your heart? And he's also praying then, I I want you to know the love of Jesus. And so as Christ dwells in your heart and you know the love of Jesus, that's foundational for your Christian life. That's your motivation for change. That will be the foundation for all of your Christian life, the main foundation, the fervor, the fervency and the passion that you have in love for Jesus in your hearts. That's the first and the most important diagnostic spiritual health check for you. Where is it? Well, maybe you, maybe you will say that it's, it's not where it needs to be. It once was. I did I didn't really love him that way, but it's not now. I feel so dry towards him. Well, I'm going to give you just one action point today. I'm going to give you several eventually, but one today. And again, the most important action point. And when I say it at first, you're probably going to say, oh, I was hoping you would come up with something new and exciting, like a key to the Christian life that I've not tried before. Um, But I'm not. I'm going to say something blatantly obvious, but just go with it, because I'm hopefully going to explain it in a way which will transform what you do. Okay, so this is it. Uh, This is your action point number one. Read your Bible daily. Read your Bible daily. Do you know when surveys are taken, uh, generally in America, isn't it, of the Christian life? Those people who would say that they were struggling and were going backwards in their Christian lives will say that the number one factor for that was what? They'd stop reading their Bible. And then the number one factor, again, in those people who said that they were growing in their Christian lives was what? That they were reading their Bibles daily. And now, the reason you may have thought, well, that doesn't do me any good, um, is probably because you've tried so many times. And maybe at the start of each year, you've tried and you've, for several days you've read the Bible and then you've given up thinking, I'm just not getting anything out of it. It just feels like a dry book to me. And so you don't sustain it and you give up. Well, let me just explain it in in a way that I think will be really, really helpful to you. You know, there there are lots of things that we can do to help uh, Bible reading. James is putting out a video today which will talk about a Bible reading scheme that we're going to be doing as a church. Please get on board with that. Um, Not just for your own benefit, but for other people's benefit. We will support you. You will support us. If we do something together, there's so much more strength and power in the sustaining of that thing we do together. And so uh, we'll be putting out lots of things, um, supplementary materials, explanations, questions you need to be asking, all of that kind of stuff. But, you, you know, you can read the Bible intellectually. 
um, and kind of work out the text. You can read the Bible morally, trying to work out from it what, what is it telling me to do in order to change. You can, you can read the Bible mechanically, just out of duty. And on, in and of themselves, they're not wrong, but without this other important ingredient, you'll probably find that your Bible reading will still be very dry. And I'm going to explain this um, from the scriptures with two different instances of people who were reading or hearing the word of God. Firstly, the Pharisees. Do you know the Pharisees? They knew the scriptures inside out. If you were a Pharisee in a quiz team, he would smash it. He would know every single verse of the Old Testament. But then when they were with Jesus, they, they were with the person who was the creator of this world, who was the word, the, the person who wrote the scriptures, the person who the scriptures is all about. And there he is, the embodiment of the word in front of them. And they couldn't stand the sight of him. They wanted him dead. And this is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. This is John chapter 5, verse 39. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So they were guys who were reading it intellectually, uh, mechanically, morally, but they were hard as nails. They were dead. They were stubborn. They actually hated Jesus. Can you see what I'm getting at here in terms of the way in which we read scripture? Now, uh, let me give you another example. After Jesus' death and resurrection, he got alongside a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they didn't recognize him. And he spoke to them, and it says this. This is Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, that's Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus speaks the scriptures to them, opens them up, and shows them himself through the scriptures. And then later on that day, this is what they said to one another. Luke chapter 24, verse 32. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What was the difference between the way the Pharisees studied the Bible and the way the followers of Jesus heard those scriptures that day? The difference was Jesus was there speaking to receptive hearts. That's Bible reading. Jesus being there, speaking to a receptive heart. Let me, let me explain it this way. The Christian life, the whole Christian life is a relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship of love with Jesus. He loving us. We loving him, walking with him. It's relational. Your Bible reading similarly should be relational not independent of Jesus. It's not something that you do academically, mechanically, morally, independent of your relationship with Jesus. So your Bible reading, my Bible reading, should be a conversation with Jesus. And this is what will make all the difference for you. Seeing what you read in Scripture as a conversation with Jesus, him speaking to you and you speaking to him. Let me explain what I mean by that and how it might look. So you come to the, the, the passage that you're going to be reading this day. And you say to Jesus, first of all, Jesus, will you help me to understand this? Will you speak to me through this, Jesus? And you engage with Jesus in the process of your Bible reading right from the get-go. And then as you're reading along, and you may, something maybe stands out to you, something maybe you don't understand, and say to Jesus, Jesus, what does that mean? Will you help me to understand it? And then as something becomes clear to you, thank Jesus. Say to Jesus, thank you for helping me to understand that. Talk to him about it. Jesus, that's, that's amazing. If it's something that you, you can see with Jesus' love for you, then worship him, adore him for his love. If there's something there that you think that he did this for me, then be grateful to him. Thank him for what he's done for you. 
If there's some way in which you see something of your sin suddenly standing out, then say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry. But our whole Bible reading experience should be conversational. Key word, please remember this. Your Bible reading should be conversational. So it's kind of almost like your prayer life and your Bible reading is all in one. But the difference that will make is that Jesus will be there and he will be speaking to a receptive heart. And you know what will begin to happen? You will begin to feel life because Jesus gives life. He's the word that gives life. And you know what? Your heart will start to change and you start to feel more love, maybe a little bit at first, but then the more you read conversationally with Jesus, having these moments with Jesus every single day and then walking with him, your heart will begin to beat again with a passionate love for Jesus. And so please, guys, you know, today's the Lord's Day, isn't it? It's a Sunday. I really would encourage you, set, set aside some time today. Uh, open the word and talk to Jesus. Pour out your heart to Jesus. Say where you're at in your life with Jesus at the moment, whether, whether, whether things are not great, whether you feel so cold. Say to Jesus, you want that to change and ask him to speak to you. Begin that conversation with Jesus. <laughs> Oh, well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to take some time today to introduce the Bible reading plan that we want to do as a church here in Baglan in the year 2021. Our aim is to read the entire New Testament in one year, starting from January, which is a really, really exciting project. But you might be sat there wondering why. Why would I want to get involved with a plan to read the whole New Testament in one year? That sounds like a lot of work. Well, let me just read to you a little passage from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul is writing to Timothy. And in verse 16, he says that all scripture, all scripture, not just some bits of it, but all scripture is God breathed and is useful. So all scripture is God breathed and is useful. But what is it useful for? Well, he goes on to say, well, it's, all, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that is us, the servants of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Paul here is seeing the value of scripture and we really need to see the value of reading our scriptures, realising that that is how God is going to speak to us this year. He's written everything down in a book for us and he wants us to read it. So as a church, we're going to try and read the whole of the New Testament in 2021, and then we're going to hopefully go on and look at the rest of the Bible as we move in to subsequent years, which is really, really exciting. Uh, but we don't want to do it on our own. We don't just want to sit here and do it on our own and not share what we're doing. This isn't an individual thing. We want to do this corporately. So as a church, we want to support everybody in the process as we start to read our New Testaments. So there's going to be a printout which will have all of the all of the monthly readings on it that you need to know. There's going to be teaching videos to really encourage and help you with your understanding of what you're reading. So for instance, I'm going to be putting out most of my Saturday videos that are going to be relevant to the month's reading. There's going to be loads of useful links and things going up on the Facebook page to help you with your reading. We're going to put links to online commentaries and we'd really encourage you to get involved with the Bible app as well where you can take out mini reading plans for different books, depending on what we're doing each month. You can track each other's progress, things like that. It's, it's a lot of fun when you do it via the app and that you get to share things uh, together. So practically then, how is this going to work? Well, there are 260 chapters in the New Testament, 52 weeks in a year. That equates to an average of five chapters a week, which isn't a huge amount really, five chapters a week. That's less than a chapter a day. But what we're not going to do is have a daily reading plan where we say you must read this particular chapter on this day. No, the plan is going to be to do it monthly. So in January, for instance, we're going to be reading the books 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. How you decide to do that within the month is completely up to you. So it may be you decide to do your reading on the weekends when you have more time. It might be that you decide to spread it out evenly, a little bit each day. 
How you do that will depend on your circumstances. So I'd encourage you just to, to join this plan regardless of how busy you are, because I'm sure that we can all make time on average for five to 10 minutes a day. That's how long I estimate it's gonna take for the reading. Now, if you watch an episode of I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here, not my cup of tea, but I've been told that there'll be more adverts in one episode than it would take to do your reading. You know, so it's, an, it's not a big, big, big time commitment. And it's really flexible as well. So if you, for instance, missed a month and you wanted to join back in the next month, that's not a problem. We'll be moving on to a new book and you can jump straight back in with us. And we'd encourage you to take a reading journal as well, to make notes when you're reading, so that when God really speaks to you about a particular passage, you make a note of it so that you don't forget. Or it could be you decide to annotate uh, your Bibles. So we're really excited about this project. But you might be wondering, why would I join this Bible reading plan? Why would I go for this monthly reading plan with Bagland Community Church when I could be doing my own Bible reading? Well, what we want to encourage is the idea of people having mutual support as they read the passages. The idea of accountability, of being able to discuss what you're reading with friends and family within the church and encourage one another to keep going with the reading plan to build each other up as you share spiritual insights about the passages. But ultimately, we are one body as a church. We're not all called to be individuals. For instance, just say I'm a hand. The hand is useless unless it's connected to the arm. And the arm is useless unless it's connected to the body. And the body is useless unless it's connected to the head. So all of us individual parts of this body, we need to be joined together if we're going to be useful as a church. And the best way for us to be useful is to be saturated in God's word and to enjoy sharing with each other about what we're reading and to pray together and just to build one another up as we go through the year 2021. And we feel this is going to be a really helpful way of doing that. So I'd like to wish you all a really happy new year as we go into 2021. I pray that we would really all get behind this Bible reading plan, that we'd be excited by it as we open up God's word and see what he's got to say to us. And I really look forward to sharing this adventure with you all. Take care and God bless.